HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Jerry Dugan. Jerry is the CEO and Senior Leadership Consultant at BTR Impact, a leadership development business focused on helping leaders create impact at work and home through the principles of servant leadership. His leadership experience includes serving in the U.S. Army, Christian ministry, and corporate talent development leader. Jerry lives in Dallas, Texas, enjoying the empty nester life with his wife, Olivia. They have two adult children, three cats, and a dog. Thanks so much for being here today, Jerry. Diane, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on here. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to have you here. I love this this subject of servant leadership, and I want to jump right in and ask you to explain to the listeners what servant leadership is, please. Yes. The the very shortest version I got was when I was serving in the army, and that is take care of the people who take care of the mission. And uh, so I've, I've applied that as much as I can. It I didn't get it right away. I, it took years to get to it. Uh, I also have a framework called TENT, which uh, since the last time we chatted to get me on here, uh, I came up with a framework. <laughs> I feel kind of cool now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little bored, you know, got it done. Uh, so tent, you know, in the military, uh, for thousands of years, militaries have used tents as a command center. So they gather information, they sort it, they share it with the people who need the information. You know, they're mobile, they're adaptable, and so on. Uh, and one of the things I learned about tents is that the fastest way to get a tent up and moving and running, actually not moving, but up and running, is you stake out the corners first. And so tent are the four corners or the four stakes that you want to put in the ground. Uh, the first one being trust building. So when you're a servant leader, you're doing things that build trust with your people uh, consistently over time. Uh, e, you're, you're empowering your people and equipping them so that they can go out and get the mission done. So that goes back to my original definition. It's taking care of the people who take care of the mission uh, and navigating for their success. So what can you do with them to support them so they're growing in their career, their knowledge, and so on? And then the final T, uh, thriving together. you got to celebrate your wins. And sadly, a lot of leaders do not do that. So uh, in a nutshell, in one framework, that is servant leadership. Uh, I took the seven pillars that I can never remember and put it in something I could remember. And that was it. So there you go. I think that's great. (laughs) Sort of glad that there was that gap in time between. Right. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) because you came up with it. Okay. So, so put that in um, context, if you would, to uh, helping leaders keep their top talent from leaving, because it feels like there's a real struggle with that these days. Oh, 
Oh, yes. Uh, so everybody's probably heard of, and if not, you've heard about it, about it now, the, the great resignation that happened yeah. during the pandemic. Uh, and if you're like, what pandemic? Okay, you, you've been under a rock. But <laughs> uh, yeah, the great resignation, 2021, something like 48 million people voluntarily left their jobs. They just said, you know what? I don't need to commute into the office. I love working from home. I love getting the extra time back with my family, love the flexibility and so on. Then 2022 came along and it was even worse. It was something like 50.5 million people in the U.S. voluntarily quit their jobs. And a new term came out of that as well, quiet quitting. Now, some folks will get excited and say, hey, but if you look at the De Department of Labor and Statistics data for 2023, it looks like we're on pace to drop below both of those two years. And that's true. However, Gallup says, yeah, people are sticking around because they're worried about the recession, that they're not going to find a job on the other side. So what are they doing? They just they're staying put. So you have a higher rate of people who've disengaged. They've quietly quit. And you've got now a higher concentration of them in the workplace. And so, you know, what does disengagement do for an organization? A lot of things, and they're not good. <laughs> uh, disengagement drops morale. Uh, disengagement drops uh, safety in the workplace. I know in hospitals, uh, more engaged teams have lower incidences of safety events. Uh, so we're talking about patient harm is dropped when people are engaged. Uh, mm -hmm. Worker injuries drop when people are engaged. Physicians, when they're engaged, make much better diagnoses than when they're disengaged. And uh, even uh, what's his name? Sean Acor from The Happiness Advantage shared some research around that where they just gave a lollipop to doctors, made them smile. And they were much more accurate in their diagnoses, which is kind of scary if you think God, about okay. that. <laughs> moving on, moving on. <laughs> uh, and, and so it's very important. A lot of folks are looking at well, how do we keep our top talent from leaving? And at the organizational level, you're seeing things like, well, let's let's compete with money. Let's just throw money at this. So we saw a lot of compensation adjustments, which are great, especially if you're at the lower levels of an organization. Mm -hmm. You are now getting those cost of living adjustments that you wanted to see for years. Um, now, for somebody who's thinking about leaving their job and you try to entice them with more money, my understanding is that lasts for about two whole weeks. And they're mm. right back to looking for another job, looking for that next opportunity that's not in your organization I know organizationally, organizationally, some HR teams are looking at what they call career pathways. So if you come in at an entry level position, where do you go from here? So in healthcare, you come in as a certified nurse or a patient care technician. How do you become a nurse practitioner where the big bucks are made? Uh, if you come in as a rookie salesperson, how do you get that sweet office in the corner? Um, if you're in IT, IT departments do really good about this. Like, how do you come from the entry-level call center job where all the angry people call and get into, like, the project manager, senior lead type of person uh, doing multi-million dollar projects for companies? And, and so there's that. However, when I talk to organizations, when I talk to leaders, uh, their biggest complaint around that is it's not happening fast enough for enough people. So it's like, yeah, that's coming, but we're doing it for one job track. We need it for like 50 job tracks. And that's another three or four years down the road. And they're quitting now. Right. Um, and then the third thing a lot of organizations are looking at is formal training. So if we show people we care and provide growth opportunities, which are really the top two reasons why people are quitting, then let's give them training. Let's, let's skill them up. Let's prepare them for other jobs laterally within the organization and it sounds great, except most companies I've talked with, most leaders I've talked with, the spots are limited and there's this fear of what if we pour this money into them and they leave mm -hmm. anyway. And of course, you know, the flip side of that is what if you don't pour this into them <laughs> and they stay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's much better to train them and, and take the risk. Uh, but there's that limit of resources. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough spaces, maybe not enough funds to send people off. And uh, consistently what I've learned over the last 10 months or so in talking with managers and directors is that they love what's being done at the organizational level. However, their need is right here, right now with the people they have. And the question is, what can I do now? 
to to help my people be re-energized, re-engaged, and see that they're cared for, that they have opportunities here. And then here's the added part, without burning them out. And that's a big fear that managers and directors mm. have, burning their people out. And and that's actually what led to the framework, Tent. I was like, I got to help these guys. But I, I can think of 15 to 20 different skills that would help them fix what's going on. However, I myself... When I was in leadership roles, I couldn't remember all these at the same time. And then that's when it hit me. Probably was the Texas heat. You know, I was out there ruck marching. (laughs) Not a good idea in the summertime, guys. I do not recommend it. I had to go home and drink like a gallon of water when I was done. But it was worth it only because I came back with enough, enough delirium to say this tent would be a great model for servant leadership, (laughs) which addresses all the things that employees were saying. I left because I didn't feel a connection with the organization's culture. I left because I didn't feel a connection to the people I worked with, which is kind of that trade off with working from home is you don't see your people every day. And some companies, (laughs) yeah, some people say, think the the answer is like, bring everybody back. But you know, people also didn't want to let go of, that flexibility they had. So some companies who are playing ahead of the game are looking at hybrid structures. They, they understand the importance of human connection, right? Build that sense of feeling cared for. Uh, Another reason why people were leaving was I didn't feel like there was any clarity on the expectations of me, whether or not I was in the office, like at home or at the office, just that lack of clarity, lack of expectations. Uh, And the other two, like of the top five reasons were, I have skills that were never tapped into that I kept offering up uh, that could have clearly helped the organization. And then the other one being, uh, I Mm. just see any opportunities for growth. Like no matter how much better I got at my job, there's no movement up and I didn't see any movement laterally. This is sort of a dead end. Why do I need to stay here? So I bundled all that up into people need to feel cared for. And they need to see opportunities for growth. And so that's where that tent comes in. Uh, You know, the the trust building is so important because uh, Patrick Lencioni had said it, you know, in the five dysfunctions of a team, uh, if you have an absence of trust, forget the rest because nobody's doing doing anything with you. Like sales prospects aren't going to buy from, they're not even going to meet with you if they don't trust you. So you got to build that trust while you're meeting with them. You got to keep that trust and keep building on it. And then when you, make the sale, you got to maintain that trust of the whole process so that they come back for more and send their friends to you. And it's the same thing with leading people. We got to trust the leader. And, you know, that's everything from what does the leader say he or she is as far as their values go? So what's your credo? What are you about? Um, when you meet with me one-on-one, is it always because I'm in trouble or there's some good stuff here too. Uh, if you tell me one thing, do you stick to it, or is it no? That's or do you try to gaslight me? I've I've worked with leaders that try to gaslight me, uh, and and people I've worked with, and it's like, did this really just happen? And, and you got to share notes with other people just to test reality. Um, that that's not so good. <laughs> and, and then nothing that leader says is trusted, and and you got to check with everybody else to verify, and and that's not a good way to lead. Um, and then. Our own triggers can cause us to betray ourselves. So, you know, some people like I know I hate the phrase whatever, like when somebody just sort of blows something off, like whatever, um, that hurts me. And it kind of triggers this a little bit of anger. And it's like, wait, if I release that anger, though, that person's going to really get defensive and we'll never be able to work anything out because they'll they'll just always be afraid, um, even if there's nothing to be afraid of. Um so, yeah, knowing our triggers, knowing how to manage ourselves. So uh, what do they call that? Emo- emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. Yeah. yeah so that self-management, uh, self-awareness, self-management, yeah. social awareness, social management. I've got a friend, Noble Gibbons. Uh, he hosts a show called The the EQ Gangster, and he, he just dives into this a lot. I, I touch on a much lighter level uh, because I got a whole framework I'm playing with here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, then, you know. The empowerment part is huge. Like people, they need to feel like their work is meaningful. You know, yeah. Because again, the, the big paycheck goes only so far. And uh, if you feel like you're just wasting your time spinning your wheels and, and collecting essentially very generous welfare, you're going to move on to something that's going to challenge you either for more money or for less money. And 
uh, empowering is so huge. In fact, providing clarity is empowering because uh, now we know what we're working with. We know what's expected because we have no doubt about what our objective is in a project or a strategic initiative. Uh, empowering can also come from just rounding with your people, finding out, hey, how are the kids doing? You know, how was sending that first one off to college? Do you feel like you were committing a crime? Because that's how I felt when we sent our son off to college. Um, I was like, we're not going to jail for that. <laughs> uh, but then asking them, like, what's working well here at at this workplace? You know, what what do you really like that we should keep doing? All right, what what's not working so well that we should probably take a look at? Um, great, awesome. Do you have any ideas on what we could do to improve the workflow here? They'll they'll give you ideas. Uh, hey, who's doing a great job here? Uh, are there any safety issues that we should keep in mind? Uh, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you you're just really excited about? You know, those kinds of questions asked on a regular basis. You know, if you have like thirty employees meeting with them once a month to have this kind of fifteen minute conversation, uh, helps them be heard for one. It gives you like the cheapest focus group ever. You know, you don't have to. Yeah, you know, it's especially if you don't have the money to go hire a company to come in and do engagement surveys. If you yeah. build trust with your people, you can have these kinds of conversations, and then you take it up a level when you come back with like a stop right, stoplight report where you say, "Hey, I listened to everybody over the past month. I uh, just want to give you an update. You know, green light. Here are the things that I've knocked out and gotten done, or we've gotten done based on your feedback, and you know, we got to keep that going." Yellow light, here are the things that we're still working on, and this is what I'm waiting for on each one of these things. And then red is, hey, it's either a no or a not right now, and here's why. So people are okay with hearing no as long as you give them the reason why yeah. in, in the bigger picture. They're like, oh, yeah, that makes more sense, and I'm so happy you got these other things knocked out. So the next month when you have these conversations again – they're even more forthcoming. And, and so I, I love that for empowering people and then delegation. I don't know how much time we have on, on this episode, but delegation alone, it, th those two things I talked about, uh, assuming you're establishing trust and maintaining trust, these two things, rounding with your people and delegating responsibility, probably the two top reasons or ways I should say that'll engage your workforce, make them feel fulfilled in what they're doing to the point where they're even willing to stick around, even if they're not getting paid more than their peers. Uh, and so with delegation, you, just, you don't just give out the stuff that you don't like or the stuff that just has to get done. Like truly look at what's on your plate as a leader. And, and there's a lot on any leader's plate. And just think, you know, what are my, what are the, th the things that I'm good at doing that need to get done? They're important to the organization and they take up a lot of my time that I time that I could use doing other things that are also important. And once you've got that list of four or five responsibilities, you can start looking at your team and thinking, which of these folks is looking to take on a responsibility that'll grow them in their decision-making or grow them in their drive for results. Like if you start looking at your team in terms of leadership competencies, growth competencies, and you share those competencies with your team and have a meeting with that first person you think you can delegate something off like, I'm trying to think something off the top of my head, um, creating the, the biweekly work schedule. You know, that's something I hear commonly in healthcare. You know, sitting somebody down and saying, hey, you look very organized. Uh, one of the things you and I have talked about in the past is your desire to one day be a supervisor or even a manager. Let me, let me share with you the competencies that this organization holds me accountable to. And they're a little bit different than what we hold you accountable to. And, and share those competencies and, and say, great. Now, which of these do you feel you need to grow the most? And hopefully their answer matches yours, which would be maybe yeah. uh, you know, driving for results or organizing people, you know, whatever it is. And, and say, great. I've got an opportunity I want to share with you. And, and this is just a discussion. You don't have to say yes to it right away. But what do you feel about taking on the scheduling task uh, of of this department? So every two weeks, we got to come up with a schedule and then share it in a timely manner. Would you be up for that? And, and this is how it links back to these competencies. And if they say yes, great. And then you're like, great, great. So this takes up like three hours a week, every week. And, and I'm talking about like when people call in even, you know, I, I got to scramble and get some people. Um is there anything off your plate we need to take? 
so that you're free to do this. And there might be some things they need to take off their plate. And, and right then and there, you can evaluate, wait, why are we still doing that? That's, I thought we did away with that. Yeah, stop doing that altogether. Or, hey, you know what? There's somebody who just joined our team. Maybe they can take that on and learn that responsibility. So now you're taking something off of your employee's plate and giving it to somebody else to develop that person. So now you're developing two people while also freeing up your time. And once they agree to this task or this responsibility area, you start talking through like, um, this is me kind of borrowing from, uh, what's his name? Ken Blanchard's situational leadership model. Mm-hmm. Uh, for him, delegation is like the, the highest tier of situational leadership. For me, I take delegation and take his model and just infuse it in there. So uh, I've got what I call like four decision-making levels. So I've now given this responsibility to my employee to develop the work schedule for the team. Um, however, there's a certain level that my employee can go like they, they can't just post it and tell everybody tough luck that <laughs> um, I still have to take responsibility for that as a leader. So maybe it's like, all right, here are the four levels, carry, crawl, walk, run. Um, so at the carry level, I'm doing all the work. You're just watching. You're taking notes. You're saying, ah, oh, this is what I would do when I become leader or this is what I would do differently. Or, hey, I just met a bunch of people I never thought I'd meet before. So Carrie is kind of like you're there to observe. You're, you're there to soak in the scenario. Uh, crawl is kind of where I would put this person with this particular task or responsibility. That's I want you to go and make the decision. But before you implement that decision, Come back to me. Let's take a look at it. We might need to massage that decision a little bit or, or learn more about your, your decision-making process to get to this point or uh, see if there's anything you missed in consideration. Uh, and then once that's done, we go ahead and execute. Uh, and so that's the crawl phase. Eventually, you may even get to where this person's trusted and you get them to the walk phase, which is they go ahead and create the schedule execute the schedule and then just report to you, Hey, I did this, this, and this, and you either give the thumbs up. Hey, awesome. Or, Oh, wait a sec. Did you know that so-and-so was taking time off next week? Um, or did you know so-and-so is having a baby and they'll be gone for six weeks? Uh, we, uh, we gotta make some adjustments. And, and so that gives you time to make some quick adjustments, but they still, for the most part, own about 80% of that process. And then run is, it is theirs. Uh, they set the schedule and they only come to you if there's an emergency or, you know, once every few weeks, you just check in to see how things are going. Um, and, and so that's kind of delegation. So kind of give you the framework tent, you know, trust building, empowering, navigating for success, thriving together. Uh, and then two skills other than building trust and keeping it two skills that will really boost employee engagement. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> and he took a breath <laughs> uh, and he took, you know listen he deserves it um okay so let me just say that i i love every aspect of that i, I think that is really terrific and appreciate you sharing it um and what if, if there's a leader listening who this is new to them um, how do they make that shift in their mindset, in their behavior, in their uh, focus? You know, that feels like uh, it, it makes perfect sense to you. It makes perfect sense to me. But I would imagine that there's people out there who are not operating this way. How do they change for the better? Yeah. Um Gosh, there's so many quotes popping in my head right now. <laughs> and uh, there's one, I don't remember who said it to me. Um, it was something I jotted down in my notes at a conference and I forgot to write the person's name down. But if you're the type of leader who is convinced you've got to show everybody your brilliance, it, it's a sure way to guarantee that nobody else contributes theirs. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible paraphrase of it. Um, mm. The the other quote that's in my head is one that came to me after I got, um, this is when I was in the army, and I got uh, 35 people killed in my unit. Uh, 
fortunately it was in training. It was a training exercise and oh. they were situationally like they, they were killed off on paper, not in real life. Uh, oh, but God. yeah. 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 So I was a, I was a sergeant in training. It was our course that we called primary leadership development course. And the whole month we were there, um, I had this habit of thinking I had to please my people by doing the work with them. Like mm. I, I won't ask you to do guard duty unless I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and also do guard duty. And the instructors kept trying to tell me day in and day out. They're like, Sergeant Dugan, very noble thing you want to do. However, you're the sergeant. Your job is different than their job. Your responsibilities are different than their job. You can still show them you care about them. You just got to do it in a different way. And mm -hmm. we don't want to see you pulling guard duty when you're in charge of guard duty. You, you got to make sure that people are showing up to actually guard things. And yeah, at the end of the cycle, the end of the 30 days, we were doing our field training exercise. I was the platoon sergeant. Uh, so first platoon, there were three platoons all together. So I had one third of this perimeter. So we're in a kind of a circle in a sense. And in the middle of the circle is a, an ammo shack where we're guarding all the blank ammo because we're still tracking it because we're army and that's what we do. <laughs> and I decide I'm going to give myself the four in the morning shift because nobody loves that shift. I can get back on the perimeter in time to wake everybody up before sunrise uh, because that's when we go on everybody. It's like hundred percent guard duty because statistically you're likely to be attacked at sunrise or sunset. So that was very much ingrained in us. Uh, but I also was a little selfish. I wanted to guard the guard shack because one of my instructors was there and I figured this is like one hour uninterrupted mm. mentorship time with myself and another soldier and then um, one of my instructors. And so it was great. And sure enough, it was just that. It was I got a lot of inside stories of what it's like to be at the next level, his level, um, how he became an instructor, things that he learned as a leader over the years because he had easily another decade on on top of me, uh, my career, like I'd only been for two years. He had been in for somewhere around 12 to 14 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of wisdom there. Well, at the end of the hour, our relief comes in and they see me uh, and they're from my platoon. They're like, oh, you're here. I was like, yeah, why? So you haven't heard. Heard what? Mm -hmm. And this soldier, she's, she's, she's a sergeant also. She said, you got fired. <laughs> and, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and that's exactly how she said it because she wanted to share the information, but then she wasn't sure how it'd take it. Yeah. So she just delivered it. And while that's going on, Sergeant Jorge, the, the guy I was being mentored by my instructor, he's in the corner of this guard shack and he's shaking his head and he's just laughing to himself. And he looked up at me and he said, I've been telling you all cycle leaders got to do leader things. And I was like, I, so what happened? And, and so basically what happened was I walked into the shack. My leader saw that immediately radioed his buddies said, guess who's in here? Yeah. The platoon sergeant. Okay. Teach him a lesson. <laughs> so while I'm in there getting like this mentorship of a lifetime, uh, the other two instructors from my class, uh, grab machine guns and they go to the one edge of my part of the perimeter. They see that instead of them being awake, they're asleep. So mm. my first squad leader didn't prepare my people to get up and be awake. So they're like, all right. They tapped them on the shoulders and said, you're dead. You're dead. Just stay there. Um, and mm. as as they did that. That was, that was it. They already killed the first position. And then they started throwing flashbangs, grenades, smoke, like, like flash grenades. Yeah. Uh, and then they just walked right down the line and mowed everybody down from the left side with machine gun fire, lots of yelling and screaming. And when it was all said and done, they were all gone. Uh, all because I wanted to be like everybody else and wow. not delegate. Like I didn't mm -hmm. delegate the responsibilities that needed to be delegated. I had to hold on to things myself. And because of that, 35 people got wiped out in training. Wow. Uh, but yeah, they, I didn't just hear it from Sergeant Jorge, though. The other guy that also kept telling me the same thing pulled me aside like an hour later. And he's like, you understand why you got fired, right? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I do, Sergeant. He said, okay, just remember, like Sergeant Jorge says, leaders got to do leader things. Yeah. And it was so weird hearing it from this guy because <laughs> he's like the gentlest guy in the world. And he was an infantryman. He's the guy who led the charge to kill all my people. Uh, <laughs> And he's just gently telling me this lesson. I'm like, I understand. I understand. And, but that was the thing. Like you got to let things go and yeah. you got to let your squad leaders lead. 
And at the same time, you, you got to let your soldiers do their thing. And, you know, what needed to happen was I needed to be there to wake up my squad leaders, all three of them, and say, all right, it's time for stand two. It's time for that guard duty, everybody on the perimeter. And all I had to do was just stay with those three guys and make sure they got their part done and support them. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to be on the front line to make sure all 30 of those guys were up and running. It, and so uh, huh. once I wrapped my head around that, I realized, oh, wow, not only do we get the job done when I trust the right people to do the right things and, and give them what they need to go get it done, it's so much easier, too. It's like, yeah. I just turn to three people and say, I need this, this, and this. And then they go and execute it with their people. They turn to their people, like their teams of 10 to 12 people and say, all right, Sergeant Dugan needs this, this, and this. You four do this. You four do that. You four, what do you think you can do? Because we're going to have to pull that one out of the air. They're like, oh, yeah, we got this, but you can't ask any questions where we got it from. And then off they go. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and, and I've had that at times where people come back and they're like, all right, we got everything you asked for. Don't ask about that one. I'm like, how'd you guys? <laughs> we said, don't ask. I'm like, all right, cool. Acquired it. Got it. Uh, so all that to say for that guy who wants to hold on to all these things tightly, every project, every piece of information, you'll actually do more and you'll do it better if you just release that to your people. Give them the information. Let them access the information. Um and I mean, verify it's not proprietary or that's you know ready for release. But once you got that clearance to share info, share it Let, and equip people to go look it up so they don't have to bug you all the time. You know, I think part of the reason why managers get burned out is because they feel like they've got to hold everything tightly. They got to know the entire schedule. They got to know where everything's kept. They, in, in to a degree, yes, you do. But it's even easier when you put people in charge of it. And let them tell you where everything is. And um, it just happens faster. You don't, you don't lose your mind in the process. And, and everybody involved feels like they have a sense of ownership on the mission and, and they go get it done. Yeah. I thank you for that. Thanks for telling that story. And, and as an example, and um, one of the biggest takeaways that I've got is that it actually makes things easier. So, you know, if you think that you're holding on to everything is making your life easier, it's not because you're, you know, it's um, many hands make light work or whatever that thing is. Um, And so getting other people involved and feeling that contribution and ownership uh, can make all the difference in the world to how successful you are. You aren't going to be successful if you're the one hanging on to everything. Yeah. And, and it's crazy in that even though somebody else does the work, you as the leader get credit for that. Yeah. You led the person who got the thing done or you led right. the team that got the thing done. I, I still remember because uh, it, it wasn't too long ago, um, but I was a director somewhere and I had the the project of – come up with a coaching model that is um, easy to remember, that's grounded in best practices. And even if somebody using it isn't perfect with it, the, the model makes enough sense that they do a pretty good job of using it with their employees. So uh, my leader gave me a stack of like seven books, 10, 15 articles that I was supposed to read. And I'm new at this job, and I'm thinking, I, I'm still learning my people's names and what we do here. On top of that, I'm supposed to read? Like, I got, no, <laughs> I got a <laughs> life here. Uh, and there's just too much to take in. It was cognitive overload in a sense. And I remember thinking in my head, all right, I, I've got a team of very capable people. I might just ask them if this is something they feel they could take on and, and give them this opportunity to put a feather in their cap. And sure enough, the first person to run into me in the hallway was our intern who was in like her last 200 hours of her internship. And she said, good morning, Jerry. How's it going? I'm like, hey, good. How about yourself? And she said, great. Hey, I'm you know here for like another month. If there's anything you need help with, let me know. And wow. I, could, I learned later on what she was expecting me to do was what I guess typically is done, which is I need 400 copies of this and I need <laughs> pencil sharpened. And, and I just remember I'm looking at her thinking – wait, I just read the agreement we have with her and her school, and we're supposed to give her projects that relate to the work we do, not administrative work. 
therefore what I'm holding in my hands right now counts. <laughs> so I just said, Hey, so what are your thoughts by the way about coaching models? Do you have a favorite one? And she lit up. She said, Jerry, we are studying that right now in my course. Mm-hmm. It's my last semester, by the way. And, um, and we're talking about coaching models. I would love to help out. What do you need? I'm like, well, how much time do you have? She's like, I'm here all day. I, I do whatever you tell me. I'm like, great. Come to my office. So I drew on my dry erase board. This is what I've been tasked with. This is what I need to find. And I'd love to have a proposal within two to three weeks to give to my boss. What do you say? She took every book off my shelf uh, that – you know, the ones I had in my hand, I, I put them down on my desk, actually. She took all those books. She took all the articles. And she even brought her textbooks in. And I, she grabbed some other book on her own that she wouldn't let us reimburse her for. I'm like, you, you really paid for that for work here. We got to reimburse you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're still arguing about that years later. <laughs> <laughs> so she came up with like her top three and I, I presented those and my boss said, well, that's not what I wanted. Uh, what I wanted you to do was create one that is ours. And I'm like, oh, and I knew that wasn't the case. And it's part of why I don't work there anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of me being gaslit. I, I yeah. did exactly what he said, which was I came up with yeah. and a list of three to choose from, pros and cons. And what he wanted now was us to blend one together. And I'm like, great. And I, I asked some clarifying questions. So I now had essentially a second project. I went, And then what he tells me is, and I want you to do it. I don't want you to hand this off to the intern. I want you to do it. And I just remember saying to him, I'm the director of a team of people who are way smarter than me. Why do you want me to do it? Yeah. What do you say? Yeah. Uh, And so I asked him before he even answered, he he said, no, they have a lot on their plate. I just want you to do it. I'm like, "Um, but I've assessed what they have on their plate. And this particular person has the time, has the willingness and eagerness and has the capability with my supervision. Is this really more of a test to see if I'm capable and he's like, no, 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 no. I trust you. I'm like, okay. No. If you trust me, do you trust me to delegate this? Right. To my team member. Uh, do you trust my judgment? Uh, because you know this is only my fourth week on the job, and I see I'm already having to ask you. Right. Do you trust my judgment. Ugh. And um, and, and he kind of gave me this underhanded little. Uh, not ultimatum, more like a, a veiled threat. Like if this bombs, it's your job kind of thing. And I'm like, I can always go home and get my old job back. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a freedom there when you can just, you know, yeah. say, I don't need to be here. I, I, I have the money to go somewhere else. Um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, short into the, the shortened version here now, or the, the end of the story is two weeks later, she gives me, she took everything I gave her as far as feedback. I protected her from all the, the, the venom that came out of my, my boss, uh, because that would have done nothing for her. Confidence right. in this. And, and so I just gave her all the facts like, Hey, this is what he's asking for. And she's like, this, that's different than what you shared. I'm like, I know it, it seems like this is the angle we were really going for. I, and I took the heat. I was like, I apologize for misunderstanding what was going on here. Two weeks later, I kid you not, she comes up with a fully fledged out, coaching model that incorporated all of his feedback as well as mine. And I was mind blown by it. I was like, holy cow, uh, you need to quit now and trademark this thing before we turn it into our boss's boss. <laughs> and she's like, I can't do that. I did this on the clock. I'm like, yeah, there's that. Uh, so what you do is if you don't get hired by us, you come up with a variation of this and yeah. trademark that. Uh, and so I took it to my boss and first question out of his mouth, did you design this or did the <laughs> And I said, the intern, well, I'm not going to look at it. I was like, you got to look at that. Um, Otherwise you just wasted five weeks of my time, yours and the interns. Mm -hmm. Uh, Besides, let me tell you why this thing's awesome. And it it meets everything you asked for. And I kid you not, I spent two weeks arguing with this guy to get him to finally get it. And we adopted it. We implemented it. And three years later, when I quit that job, uh, that intern who I wound up hiring uh, gave me a, a farewell note and it said, thank you so much for taking a chance on me, you know, with no experience coming out of school. And it wasn't just that you trusted me to hire me. You trusted me before you hired me to design a project that was a big deal. Wow. Like I brag about that project, to everybody in my family. Um, and I brag about it on my, in- I already knew she was interviewing to go somewhere else as well. 
And so she, uh, it made me cry. I was like, oh my gosh, uh, if it wasn't time to go, I would, I would unquit right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, thank you so much. And I, I, I still share that when I talk about delegation because that happened three years, well, four years ago now, but at that time, three years ago, it was just a project. It was a really good project, a very beneficial one. And I, I knew the impact it had on me, you know, and, and seeing her come to her potential and, and go beyond it. I didn't realize what an impact it had on her that she stuck around for as long as she did because of stuff like that, that right. I would trust her with a program, let her learn it on her own, help her where she asked for it and needed it. And I never took things back from her. And, um, you know, counter to that, I worked for somebody who was like the person you described that they can't let go. Yeah. Repeatedly give her responsibilities and then take them back for sign of trouble. Yeah. Um, and so by the end, all he had really trust her with was, hey, check on the embroidery on those jackets for me or go pick mm. up the mail. And like, I'm like, she has a master's degree and she's smarter than us. Um, that's a waste. And true. Uh, that's what I was just thinking. That yeah. That is such a waste. And, and she wound up leaving. She went to another organization <laughs> where they gave her a, I think it was a 60% pay raise. Wow. Um, it was after I left, so I, I didn't care anymore. I was happy yeah. for her. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just there's so much you can get from people and not in a manipulative way either. Like if you genuinely build trust with them, genuinely care for their success and you let them have responsibilities and let them run with it or get them to where they can run with it. I mean, one, they'll surprise the heck out of you almost every time. And two, um, they'll remember that they'll like, you become the stories, the good stories they tell. Right. They move up in their careers. And, right. You know, they, they emulate you for the good things. Like, Oh, yeah. wow, I want to do this for my people when I lead and, and they'll do it. Uh, I mean, either way, you're going to leave an impression with your people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the things I will always do and the things I will never do. And exactly. You get to choose which one of those you get to be, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Oh, Jerry, this is great. I I really appreciate it. I think this has been tremendously valuable um, for the listeners. So thank you for joining me. Yeah, and uh, will you let them know how they can find you? Yeah. Uh, let's see. We're talking leadership development. So uh, I guess my company website makes sense. Uh, BTRimpact.com. BTR stands for Beyond the Rut, uh, which is also the name of my podcast. Uh, so BTR Impact, because I want to help leaders have a beyond the rut impact with the teams they lead. But I also want leaders to be able to create a life they feel is worth living in their faith, their family, and their career. So eat your cake, have it too. I said that wrong, but you know what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you meant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We all got to stick together, right? Yep. So, all right. Excellent. Thank you for that. And listeners, thank you. You are who we're doing this for. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Hey friends, this is Jim Knight, former 21-year Hard Rock executive turned best-selling author and top 10 keynote speaker. And I'm Brant Menzoir, former frontman of Hollywood's most dangerous band turned top 10 motivational speaker and best-selling author. We host the how-to podcast, Thoughts That Rock, where we talk to rock stars, athletes, CEOs, astronauts, and even next door neighbors who share their expertise and opinions. Together, we tackle the most interesting and challenging topics of today. Whether you want to learn how to become more confident, how to deal with anxiety at work, or how to write a hit song, or use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in life, we've got hundreds of episodes to help amp up your life and move you forward. Subscribe to Thoughts That Rock wherever you listen to podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com for more information.